Excellent. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome. My name is Vance Breedenberg. I'm a professor in biology at San Francisco State University. And um, quiero decirles bienvenidos a todos. Estamos muy felices de estar aquí online con ustedes. Um, and today we are here to um, talk about the San Francisco State Department of Biology virtual Gator Talks. So thank you so much for being here. So before we start, I just want to make sure everyone is aware of the fact that this session is being recorded um, and as this is a webinar. So your video feed will not be visible in the recording, but um, this is being recorded and so people can come look at this later. All right, well, um, to start out, here is our agenda for the, uh, for the virtual Gator Talks. We're gonna start out, well, you can see it here, I'm not gonna read it all out to you, but um, what I am gonna do is tell you that it goes from three o'clock until five o'clock. And there's a variety of panels, um, as well as um, student speakers and pro professors that will help sort of guide you in terms of trying to understand what it's like to be an undergraduate here at SF State. Um, so we're, again, we're very excited to be here and we're very, very happy to have you all here. So let me begin by introducing the department chair, um, Dr. Laura Burris, who is the professor of uh, the professor and chair of our department. And um, she is a cell and molecular biologist. And if you've ever wondered how cells communicate with each other, that's what Laura has done for her research um, over the last many years. Um, so, um, so with that, I will pass it over to Laura, who's going to tell you more about our department. Thanks so much, Vance. Um, Laura Burris, I go by she, her, and hers. And I'd also like to introduce Brianna Franklin, who can wave at you. She's our undergraduate specialist. If you ever email the Department of Biology at biology at sfsu.edu, Brianna is the person that you will uh, find. And she is super helpful and super awesome. Um, so today, I want to give you a little bit of background about the department and um, let you know what we have to offer so that you can decide whether this might be a good choice for you. So first of all, we're really um, proud to be the city's university. And by that, I mean the San Francisco's university and San Francisco is such a wonderful and vibrant city. And um, San Francisco state really represents all the diversity and um, beauty that San Francisco has to offer. So first off, I wanna start off with a quick poll. I wanna learn a little bit about you so that we can kind of maybe tailor our presentation towards you. So which of the following best describes you? Are you an incoming freshman, um, a loved one, family member of a freshman, transfer student, or a loved one of a transfer student? So I'm gonna let you weigh in real quick. Terrific. So it looks like we have mostly students and a little bit of loved ones, but we welcome all the families and important people um, to our presentation today because we know that uh, school affects everybody and not just the students. So thank you for that. The next thing I want to um, find out from you is where are you located right now? We know that um, people come to San Francisco State from all over the world. So we're curious whether you're located in the Bay Area, in Northern California, Southern California, Western United States, Eastern United States, or outside of the US. So weigh in and let us know where you're, where you're coming from. All right, terrific. So, uh, so far all Californians, but, um, that's just who's on the, the call today. We have students from all over, but um, looks like we're mostly represented by the San Francisco Bay Area and a little bit of Northern California and Southern California too. So thank you. We welcome you wherever you're from and know that it's a little hard to evaluate a campus when, when you can't um, be there. And so we're gonna do our best to tell you about the campus and what we have to offer at the department. And so, um, First, I wanna say that one of our many strengths, not our only strength, is our location. We are located in San Francisco, which is just an amazing city. It's full of diversity and art and culture and science. We don't think of San Francisco as being a big, the science city, that's not how it's known, but it really is. Um, we are 
on the ocean. So we have access to thinking about marine biology and things, coastal um, biology. We are also located on the bay. So how unique is that to have the ocean and the bay? We have um, the Sierra Nevada Field Campus, which allows us to be in the mountains, um, setting the plants and the flora and the fauna, and also seeing the beautiful night skies up in the Sierras. So we have so much going for us, and there's so much natural um, diversity, not only human, but ecological diversity in the Bay Area, that there's just so much to do. That diversity in this location really drives our alumni to be innovators in the Bay Area. So if we look at where our alumni are employed, um, some of them are employed at San Francisco State, which is awesome. We like to keep a pipeline of students coming into our own university. But we are also one of the um, biggest pipelines to Genentech and Biotech. And as you know, the San Francisco Bay Area is just a huge um, incubator for biotech. Um, it's also a huge incubator for medical care. So we have UCSF and the UCSF Medical Center the Cal Academy of Sciences for our ecology and evolution, um, more biotech and other universities and biomedical related things. So we have a wide array of types of jobs that students go into, including government jobs in conservation and ecology. And um, we really drive the scientific workforce in the Bay Area. You go anywhere to a hospital or to any scientific kind of agency and ask, who do you, where do your alumni come from? And they'll tell you they come from San Francisco State. So our vision as a department is really to change the face of science by training diverse scholars to answer urgent questions across biology, whether it be human um, and ecosystem health or to the nature of life itself. And so what I mean by changing the face of science is all too often when you study science in your classes, um, the pictures of the scientists you see are all white and all male and mostly dead. And so we really want to change the face of science to reflect the wonderful diversity of our communities and such as those in San Francisco. So what are the things that we're most proud about in biology? Um, Money Magazine named us as one of the 30 most transformative universities in the country. We're super proud of that. That means that anybody can come in and really have an excellent experience and be transformed by that experience. And so I think of us as being, we certainly bring in a lot of talent, but it doesn't have to all be developed when they get to us. We're not a talent selection model, we're a talent development model. We'll take you wherever you're at and send you on your way ready to be a leader in your community. The next thing that we're super proud of is that we foster excellence and diversity. San Francisco State is grounded in social justice. This is who we are, and it's perhaps what sets us apart from some of the other CSUs. Is this is in the fabric of who we are. So San Francisco State is ranked in the top 5% of all schools in the country in terms of ethnic diversity. We are considered to be a Hispanic-serving institution as well as a minority-serving institution. And those offer us some great opportunities. Next. I think that we are excellent in teaching in the Department of Biology. 85% of our faculty have undertaken professional development to create more inclusive classrooms and to be more evidence-based instructors. We use evidence to do our science right, you know, and use evidence like, did this work, did this not work? Well, now we do that in our classrooms too. And what you'll find is that we value hands-on learning and actively engaging students in their own learning. We're only one of 50 universities in the country to be awarded an HHMI Inclusive Excellence Grant that's provided this training for our instructors. Next, excellence in research. We have amazing faculty researchers. They do, it's incredible what they can do. And so just as an example of how amazing they are, the National Science Foundation gives out these NSF career awards, which are super prestigious. And our department in San Francisco State has earned more of these awards than any other biology department in CSU. So we're super proud of the research accomplishments of our faculty. And what's really cool is that students can engage in research in those faculty members' labs. And so it's a way to get your hands wet and be engaged with that. We also foster excellence in community engagement. Um, our faculty are working to ask innovative questions that are relevant to our local community. 
And so we have a SF build project that engages students in thinking really about health disparities in their communities. And lastly, we offer an excellent personalized experience. And so what I mean by that is you can call me Dr. Burris or Professor Burris and that's okay. But most of us here would say that we'd go by our first name. So most people just call me Laura and that's great. I wanna be Laura. And um, you'll know your faculty by your first, their first name. And it's when you ask students who have transferred in from other places, they'll say that it's just cozier. It's just, it's just different. There's a different feeling about the way that we interact and how, pers how well students get to know the faculty. And so we're really proud of that personalized experience. So we have, um, starting in the fall, our concentrations will change up just a little bit. And so there's um, going to be one, two, three, four, five, six concentrations in general biology, cell and molecular, ecology, evolution, and conservation biology, marine biology, microbiology, and physiology. And um, in addition to those, we'll have a little panel discussion about those shortly. In addition to those, which we may or may not talk about as much, we have some interdisciplinary minors. We're starting to realize that some of the most exciting things happen at the intersection between different disciplines. And so we have some interdisciplinary minors and certificates. The first one is offered for biology students who are interested in learning how to code. And so it's called PINK for promoting inclusivity and in computing. And the second one is a new certificate in climate change causes, impacts, and solutions. Um, you won't find it on a website yet because it just got approved, but it'll be launched this fall and we'll be sending out information about that over the summer. So um, next poll is in general, which concentration is most interesting to you, right? Based on what you know right now, and then we'll go into the panel, but this will give us an idea of um, different people's interests. General biology, which offers you a very broad experience, cell and molecular, ecology and evolution, marine, <clears throat> micro and physio. Okay. Terrific. Thanks so much for weighing in. And I'll share those results. I think you can see them anyway. And then we'll go to the next slide. I'm going to close up the poll. So before we go to the panel about the different concentrations, what I want to let you know is that you'll have an opportunity to um, check out different classes. So because we're virtual right now, you are able to come just pop in on some of our virtual classes and see what it's like to be a biology major. And so to do that, you'll want to go to this link right here. And I'm actually going to pop in the chat, if I can find the chat real quick, a copy of the PowerPoint um, presentation. And um, that way you'll have all the links that we're talking about. So I'm going to put in this PowerPoint presentation right now and make it go to everybody, I hope. There we go. And it's on its way. Okay. So, so you'll have all these links, but if you want to sign up to attend a class, then you'll be able to sign up to attend any one of about five or six different classes just to see what it's like and get a feel for what it's like to be a student here at San Francisco State, at least while we're virtual. Okay. So first, um, I want to give some students of ours the chance to tell you what it's like to be a student at San Francisco State. They're the ones on the ground. They're going to have the experience closest to yours. And so I want to let them have a chance to do that. So Vance is going to introduce the students and then we'll get going. Thank you so much, Laura. All right. So um, the student lightning talks is a, a, it's going to be 23 minutes long. And you can see the three speakers here. We're going to start out with um, Katie Padilla. And she has a BS uh, in cell and molecular biology. Um, she, she finished it, I believe, I can't remember, I don't know how long ago you finished, but you can tell us about that. And she's now currently in her second year in the master's uh, program here. So Katie, um, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, should I, uh, can I share my screen? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Let me Laura. Stop sharing mine. Yeah. You should be able to share yours. Awesome. Oh. All right. Um, can you 
see my slides? Yes, looks great. Okay, awesome. Um, hi and welcome everyone. My name is Katie. Um, I'm currently a second year as previously stated. Um, I am currently in Carmen Domingo's lab where like Laura's lab, we actually study developmental biology as well. And so the title of my master's thesis is identifying and analyzing candidate target genes of muscle specific microRNA mirror 206 during embryonic muscle development in Xenopus labes, which is the African clod frog that you can see on the left. Um, so in the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and break that down for you and give you an overview of what my project aims to do. Um, but before we do that, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. So I was a transfer student, um, like a lot of you are. <laughs> and um, during my undergrad, I actually had no clue what I wanted to do. I actually thought about having a career, doing a career in patent law. Um, but within the two years of, after I transferred, I had been encouraged to do research um, by, a gen by one of my genetics professors. And, and so I found my home lab and I just fell in love with research. And because I didn't get that much experience, I was encouraged to, you know, pursue my master's. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. And throughout these past four years, I've been heavily supported and just encouraged by, you know, the faculty in this department, as well as student enrichment offices and um, just everyone to, oops, sorry, to eventually figure out that I wanted to do a PhD. So um, I'm actually PhD bound come this fall. So I'm actually really excited and really grateful for everyone who's been part of this journey with me. Um, so now back to my research, like I said, um, our lab focuses on development. And so we mainly focus on, on embryonic muscle development. And so in Xenopus and other organisms, that's the formation of these um, entities called somites. So um, the image on the left, you can see that's a growing embryo to almost a pre-tadpole frog. And the arrows are pointing to pairs of somites. And so what's cool about somites is that they're temporary structures and they give rise to things like our skeletal muscle, our dermis, our tendons, um, a good amount of things that we need for proper muscle movement. And so the way I try to study embryonic um, or the formation of somites is through understanding the role of microRNAs and how they um, regulate gene expression. So, um, microRNAs essentially, they silence gene expression post-transcriptionally. So when you think of the central dogma, you know, we have DNA is transcripted to RNA, which is then translated to proteins. MicroRNAs are a strand of, strand of nucleotides that essentially bind to messenger RNA and stop translation of proteins. So to give you a better idea of how, you know, they work and how, uh, what we're trying to study, we're gonna look at the microRNAs of orchestra music. So essentially, you know, you have your DNA, which is the sheet music that they're using, and then RNA are all the musicians and pretty much everything that um, is used to make the beautiful music, which is essentially the protein. So if you think of a conductor, you can, you can actually understand how microRNAs work because they regulate how musicians play music. You know, they can silence musicians and make other musicians play even louder. And so, you know, for an orchestra, you know how a conductor is communicating, but in developmental biology, we don't know these aspects. We don't know where, who they're communicating with, how they communicate them. And so that's kind of what my project aims to do and hopefully give us a better understanding of, you know, why they're important for development and how essentially we can relate this to uh, diseases like muscular dystrophy. And so that's kind of just the overview of my, um, of my thesis right now. Um, and yeah, so. Hopefully you join next fall. It's a great program and um, great people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, all right. Well, next we're gonna we're gonna have a uh, talk from Maria Flores, and with that, Maria, I'll uh, pass it on to you. Oh, uh, your um, microphone is there. We go. Can everyone see that? Awesome, cool. Um, well, thank you everyone for the introduction. Um, I wanna apologize ahead of time for my outdoor background. Um, I'm currently at UCLA where I will be attending in the fall to pursue my PhD in bioinformatics. Um, so I'm super excited, um, but without further ado, uh, like Laura mentioned, I did graduate from SF State um, in the fall 
um, December 2020. Um, I had the most amazing experience at SF State. Um, so I hope, you know, if you guys decide to come here, you have the same experience. So to start off, I um, I'm currently still working uh, in the Rolfs lab, um, Dr. Rory Rolfs. Our lab focus is on forensics and population genetics. Um, and we assess the accuracy of forensic tools using the statistical programming language R. Um, so I was actually, uh, I received my minor in computer applications. If you notice in the beginning, um, Laura mentioned that there is a program called the PING program. And I was a part of that program and I did complete the program. And I, uh, when you complete the program, you do get a, um, a certificate in computer applications once you finish. Um, so I, I did get that, which is really cool. Um, and I also wanted to note that in joining labs or joining programs like the PING program, no coding experience is required. Um, you literally don't need any kind of expertise in coding or have had taken a class prior um, to join. So if you're interested in learning computation or just coding in general, um, I would definitely recommend it. I learned a lot in my time in the PING program. Um, and in, in my current PI's lab, um, we do mostly computational work. So um, this here is actually the project that I work on or what I'm focusing on in the lab right now. Uh, our project is called Low Template Analysis or LTA for short. Um, so low template analysis is really just the analysis of low amounts of DNA um, that are found at crime scenes. Um, so our question is, are individuals from populations with low genetic diversity, or in other words, low genetic variability, more likely to be wrongfully identified as contributors to DNA mixtures? Um, so Forensum, uh, which you can hear on the slide, see on the slide, is a package, a statistical forensic analysis package that we use in our research to try to understand um, false positive rates among these forensic tools. Um, and in this uh, diagram that you see on the right, um, this kind of is just like a step of our algorithm or a step by step of our algorithm that we made uh, to try to do this analysis. So we simulate populations using allele frequency distributions um, that we retrieved from forensic literature. And using those allele frequencies, we simulate individuals um, that includes a suspect as well or can uh, exclude the suspect as well. And we mix that DNA to, to generate this crime scene profile. Um, and from this crime scene profile, we use Forensum to give us a likelihood ratio, which is just a value um, allowing us to understand how likely a person was actually involved in the DNA mixture. Um, and from those likelihood ratios, we calculate our false positive rates. So how often um, the tool mistook someone as a suspect in the DNA mixture, even though we knew that they were not in the mixture. Um, so why is this even important? Like, why am I talking to you about it? Um, this definitely has a social justice aspect to it um, in terms of this specific method being used by law enforcement or increasingly being used by law enforcement. Um, and that's obviously a rise for concern because we're not really sure um, how accurate this method is, right? And on top of the fact that um, most databases only really have European data or European population data. Um, so because we don't have um, the research done to try to understand how this affects communities of color, or, you know, uh, people of color, these groups that are underrepresented um, and make up the majority of the criminal justice system. Um, this is why I'm so passionate about this project and why I have chosen to work on this because um, that's something I want to try to fix or, you know, do research on because it's, there's not enough being done there. Um, and just kind of why SF State, uh, these are just my little bullet points of why I chose SF State. Um, first off, like Laura mentioned, diversity. Um, I am completely grateful to the EOP program and the SEO program for having supported me in my research and having funded me to be able to do what I love. Um, and the, to the biology department for having supported me in being able to do what I do and be able to do what I love. So. Um, I love the biology department at SF State and I owe them my success. I owe it to them, you know, my successes um, so far, as well as my lab, because we we're definitely a family and um, I wouldn't be here without them. And if I, something, what do I know now that I wish I knew then? Um, I just want to touch on really quickly opportunity. Please, please ask about opportunity. There's so many opportunities out there. 
you have no idea. There's a long, long list. So SF State offers a huge variety of different things that you can get into. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, you never know where you end up if you just ask. So um, yeah, that's my presentation. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Maria. That was really great. Um, and Katie as well. Okay, and our third student lightning uh, speaker is Priscilla Perry, and she's gonna tell us about her research. Go ahead, Priscilla. All right. Present. Okay, so my name is Priscilla. I'm a senior. I'm actually a biochemistry major. I'm an implant to the Department of Biology, um, but I found solace uh, in my research in biology. And so that's what I'm going to be talking um, to you guys about today. I'm actually also an NIH RISE fellowship, and that's what really got me interested in research at SF State in general. I probably would have never gotten into it. Um, as well, I am a transfer student, um, and I was able to obtain my fellowship to do research the very same semester that I transferred here, just by asking people and um, getting to know people and stuff like that, and really reaching out to the faculty at SF State. So I'm in Dr. Anastasov's lab for research, and I was drawn to the Department of Biology because I just found their their um, research a little bit more interesting for me. He's working with neuroscience and vision. Um, and so what we're looking at right here is actually called a skate. And it's a deep sea water um, species that actually has only rods. So rods help you see, um, in humans, rods help you see at night and cones help you see like in daylight. And so these skates are a rod only species and that makes sense because they're towards the bottom of the ocean. And so what we found was as they start to move towards the top of the ocean, their rods start to respond differently to different intensities of light. So it's like the rods are acting as cones. And so that is pretty much the premise of our research is trying to figure out how these rods are acting as cones. And the more we learn about it and the possible evolutionary adaptations that have taken place, um, that research can be applied to vision restoration efforts in human beings. And what that would look like is if there is, um, if it's a DNA or RNA um, difference, you know, something like CRISPR or anything like that to where, how would you um, transfer that into the human genome possibly? or if it's anatomical, morphological, or some sort of connectivity that evolved over time, how can we use stem cells to apply that to human beings? So that is really what got me interested in the research. It's a long um, journey, but just getting started, I've had the most amazing time. So my research in particular, this is actually stuff that I've been able to reconstruct in the lab. Um, the, the top image, are photoreceptors and the retina, the skate retina in particular. And so they kind of look like a tree branch and all the roots are kind of the connectivity um, situations going on. And so we've began to reconstruct the inside of a skate retina. And the lower image are actually synaptic ribbons and those are inside of the photoreceptors. And so what we found is in human um, species, we typically have like one photoreceptor one, sorry, synaptic ribbon per photoreceptor. And we're already finding that two, three, or four ribbons exist. So as you can see, we're already finding differences in skate retina versus um, human retina. And I've only been in the lab for two years. And so I've been able to be a part of that. And it's super exciting. I'll be able to be published by the time I graduate. And so I've just had the most amazing time in the um department and I'm actually pre-med. So getting this research experiment experience has been great for me and I'll take this with me forever. I've had the most amazing time. And so, like I've said, my time here, I've had nothing but a positive experience. As soon as I came here as a transfer, I was very nervous, but the faculty here really wanna see you succeed. Um, and so, like it was said before, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there um, and get to know your um, professors and things like that. And also just like, if you're interested in research, like visit the SEO office, ask your teachers if 
there's any opportunities, but that is my um, experience in the Department of Biology and I've had a great time. So I hope you guys do too. Thank you guys. Well, thank you, Priscilla. That was really great. Thank you, all three of you. And now what we're gonna do is allow everyone just a few minutes of Q and A. Um, so we have about eight minutes. Um, if folks would like to either speak up or um, we can also try to answer things in the chat as well. Um, so um, does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Yeah, any questions for the student panelists in particular about their experience or anything? So does, does anyone want to tackle this one? There's a question in Q&A. Is research experience guaranteed to upper division students? Or how do you get into a research lab? Katie, do you want to tackle how to get into a research lab? Yeah. yeah. Um, there's kind of a few different ways. Sometimes if you take classes and you really enjoy the class, um, the professor might approach you about joining their lab. Or um, a lot of students, what I found is they actually just look at the profiles on the website and kind of see what um, what certain faculties are doing, what they're interested in, and see if that's something you know that you would be interested in. So what they do is they usually contact them, um, either an email or just you know maybe office hours or something, and see if there's space to join and kind of get an experience. And it's okay to you know try a lab and and maybe it didn't work out. And that happens a lot of times where people will be in one lab and realize they wanna do a different type of research and that's okay. I think um, what's great about the department is that everyone's so understanding and they just wanna make sure students are in the right place that it's okay to you know, experience different types of research, but definitely be proactive about it. Okay. So I'll... I'll bite off another question here. Somebody asked, what's the most fun class you've taken at San Francisco State? Maria? Yeah, so the cool thing about San Francisco State is the wide variety of classes that are available to students. Um, I had a real interest in learning um, ASL actually, and I took up an ASL one class at SF State and I had the most amazing time in that class. Um, I'm still actually studying ASL, so I've been actively um, learning ASL and I uh, honestly, it was thanks to SF State that I even got to get a chance to do that. Um, and not to toot my own horn about my expertise in forensics, but my PI um, has a forensic genetics course um, that honestly will blow your mind. Um, I definitely recommend that class um, if you're interested in some sort of like genetics or uh, forensic science. Um, that was definitely one of my top two favorite classes. All right, terrific. And um, Kimberly Tanner, you're here. Can you answer the question, what are the options for students who don't want to do research? Uh, I think that there are, uh, I'm Kimberly Tanner, I'm a professor of biology. I think there are a lot of options for students who don't want to do research. I think there are um, service learning courses we have in the department where you can partner with faculty members and think about how to make our curriculum more culturally responsive. We have courses sometimes where you can go out and teach science in the community. Uh, I think there are all sorts of opportunities to work with advisors like myself to find ways to get internships or to uh, volunteer or get sort of part-time jobs that will give you practice for the career you want to do. So I think that's where advisors can be really helpful and sometimes taking particular um, service learning courses is another way to go. Thank you so much. Vance, do we have more time or should we move on? You're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we should probably move on. Um, okay. There are a lot of questions in the Q and A um, there, and we will um, we'll probably try to answer those as as it goes on. With uh, yeah, and our, our panelists can keep it. typing in the yeah, answers okay. on the Q and A. So panelists, feel free to pop in some answers there and and keep the flow going. So I'm going to share my screen again, and. Um, Remind you that we have um, six different concentrations starting in the fall. And I'll, I'll just speak up the one question that came through the, the Q&A was, what happened to zoology? It's on your website. And so we've done a curricular change to make it more, 
make our programs more straightforward and to make it easier to switch between majors. And the botany, zoology, and ecology programs are still there, but they've been merged into a new major called ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. So all the same classes are still there. It's just that they're merged into a larger program called EECB. And so I'm going to let the representatives of these programs introduce themselves in order and then just say one minute about each of their concentrations, and then we'll open it up for questions about the particular concentrations. So, right, Vance, so start us off. Yeah, I'll start. So, um, so I am an advisor, actually, for, for the uh, general biology major, which is a Bachelor of Arts. So there's two different um, uh, degrees that we give in the Department of Biology. One is the Bachelor of Arts, and then the other is the Bachelor of Science. And, and the only real difference is that um, the Bachelor of Arts is just fewer units that are required within, within biology. So it's meant to be a little bit more broad um, and it uh, allows students uh, a little bit more flexibility uh, in terms of the kinds of courses that they wanna take. So for example, you can take more courses outside of biology and still get a degree in biology in the Bachelor of Arts compared to the Bachelor of Sciences. Um, so, um, so I'll pass it on now to the next person that's gonna talk about the Bachelor of Science. Layla. Layla, you're muted, I think. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Hi, uh, my name is Layla Legesi, and I'm a second year master's student here at um, SFSU. I graduated here uh, for my undergrad in 2019 uh, with a BS in cell molecular biology. And so I decided to stay and continue my education and do my master's as well, also in cell molecular biology. And currently I'm pursuing an MD PhD degree after I graduate. So a little bit about this major um, is that it explores pretty much cells and molecules to give you like an understanding of an organism's um, structure and function. Uh, the class, you take classes such as cell biology, uh, microbiology, immunology, neuroscience, et cetera. Um, and these classes introduce you to research methods, um, I think early on in your college career, uh, which will allow you to kind of build on those skills throughout different courses, labs, or uh, research opportunities that are um, available here at SF State. And this major prepares students to be competitive for areas such as uh, graduate degree programs for, like MD or PhDs, also um, to enter professional programs uh, or industry jobs. So like many people that I know or many students have went on to intern or work at um, pharmaceutical companies uh, such as Genentech. Personally, um, I really loved uh, majoring in this concentration. I think that it definitely prepared me for uh, the MCATs, which is like a test that you take to get into medical school. And I hope that you consider this major when you're exploring all the other amazing majors available. Next on the list is um, ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. Gretchen, you're muted. Oops, I don't hear Gretchen. We'll go to um, marine biology real quick until Gretchen can come back. Hello, I'm Holly Harris and I'm a lecturer here at SF State. And I got both my bachelor's and my master's in marine biology. And it's very enjoyable because we have great facilities both in Hensel Hall and at our other campus at EOS. We have a whole saltwater uh, tank room for live specimens to look at in our labs. And then we have a large library of preserved specimens also. And classes are also held at EOS, which is this 53 acre campus on Tib Tiburon. And it's a gorgeous campus right on the water. And we have boats there, but we also take field trips with the classes to our local beaches and tide pools. Um, to look at the algae and the invertebrates. Um, there's a new program called DEEP, the Diving into Ecology and Evolution program, where students do scientific diving, and it's a semester-long program, and they go off 
into both in San Francisco and on another campus in another area. Uh, it was Hawaii a couple of years ago, um, but it could be Palau or they're, they're considering other sites. So that's for people who want to dive. Um, so it's super enjoyable. We have wide variety of courses and I had a wonderful time with both of my majors. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Gretchen, are you back? Gretchen was back. Okay, we'll try physiology with Chris Moffat. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm uh, Chris Moffat. I'm one of the, uh, the physiology uh, professors at San Francisco State. Um, physiology is uh, the, the largest of the, the majors on, uh, in, in biology. And I, I think that was kind of reflected in uh, the, the poll that, that Laura ran uh, early on uh, in today's presentation. Um, the physiology major is a, is a great major for uh, students who are interested in careers in the, the health sciences. And so uh, we have uh, many students who are looking to, per, um, to pursue careers uh, in, in medicine, uh, either as physicians or physician's assistants. Um, we also have dentists and uh, students uh, who want to become physical therapists. It's also a fantastic major if a person wants to pursue a, a career in nursing. Um, as it allows you to take all the, the, the nursing prerequisite courses. Um, the research in the uh, physiology group, uh, it uh, covers primarily uh, comparative physiology. So a lot of folks studying uh, animals, we have folks studying uh, uh, cephalopods, uh, so octopus and, and squid. Uh, I study uh, drosophila, so fruit flies. And we have several, um, we have one person who studies uh, the physiology of marine organisms and as well as bird song and um, uh, let's see who else. Um, uh, I think that's pretty much covers it actually, insect, another uh, insect physiology just like myself. So there's uh, plenty of opportunities to get involved in, in research. And uh, I guess really just one last thing I'd like to say about the physiology uh, concentration is that while it's a, a really good one for pursuing careers in the health scientists in the, in the health sciences. It's definitely not the only one. Um, certainly, I would encourage students who have a, want to become physicians but have a real passion for, say, marine biology or cell and molecular biology, to um, pursue their their concentrations uh, uh, to pursue to pursue those concentrations because they're they're great opportunities, uh, and you can take pretty much all the classes you need for uh, the prerequisites for medical school or nursing or, or what have you in the other majors as well. So I would encourage you to talk to an advisor in one of the majors and they will help you uh, plan out your, your, your college degree so that you can pursue your career goals. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, Laura, Gretchen, can you hear me ready? now? We they can, can hear, hear me you. now? Finally, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm Gretchen Laboon. I'm a scientist who studies ecology evolution and primarily conservation biology. And um, the ecology, evolution, and conservation biology is, uh, is the place that people who are really interested in environmental issues, in animals, plants, other organisms end up. And I just thought I'd, I'd tell you a little bit about how I got there. Um, I did not do my undergraduate degree in biology. I did it in something wildly different. And um, while I was working, I realized that really the major issue facing humanity was the loss of biodiversity and climate change. And so I went back to school in ecology and evolutionary biology to try and figure that out. Um, the, um, the, the main thing, so um, to do that, I studied conservation biology, which is really trying to figure out how to get um, organisms, plants and animals, and, and other organisms um, the planet, but underlying conservation of ecology and evolutionary biology. So ecology is um, the interrelationships between organisms and their environment and um, evolution is how organisms 
change in response to changes in their environment, changes in other or with other organisms and things like that. The students who, who study um, in the ecology, evolution and conservation biology program are often those who are interested in going on to graduate school. They're interested in going and doing environmental consulting. They wanna be the botanist for the forest service. They want to work with San Francisco city parks on making those parks healthy and good places for, for species and people. And they, um, they study sort of how populations uh, evolve through time. So we have a number of people who are interested in how organisms respond to disease, um, what, how communities change as, um, as we see urbanization happening. So it is really an exciting place to be and um, we love having new students come and join us. I'll stop there, thanks. Terrific, thanks so much, Gretchen. And so I've been busily typing answers into uh, the Q&A. Vance, do you wanna bring some up and point them to direct particular people to answer? I'm sure. Uh, we just, we forgot one person, which is Ravinder Segal. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry, Ravinder. It's okay, he's going to about microbiology. So well, that's why we have co-facilitators. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to see the new students. I wish I could see you, but I want to tell you about the microbiology major because it's a very pertinent major. So right now I was just teaching about the coronavirus this morning. I teach a class called Emerging Infectious Diseases. And I was teaching about the replication of the coronavirus in our cells. And so what the microbiology major is, you learn about microbes, which could be viruses, or they could be bacteria, or they could be parasites. They also teach a class called parasitology, learning about all the different parasites on this planet. So our students in the microbiology department and major, they end up going into several different avenues. One is the clinical lab sciences avenue where a bunch of people go on to become um, lab, uh, work in those really important labs now that are basically telling whether you have the coronavirus or not. Otherwise they go into medical school or veterinary school, or they can go into graduate school. So for example, I study diseases of birds. I study malaria. And so we are very interested in how that is affected by climate change and deforestation. We have other professors studying bacteria. We have other ones studying viruses. And so we have a lot of really interesting projects in our laboratories and a lot of interesting courses. So the microbiology one, obviously right now with the pandemic, this is one that's on the top of everybody's mind. But um, please let me know if you have any questions. That's microbiology. Thanks, Terrific. Ravinder. Um, excellent. Well, um, I guess at this level, we have a few minutes for questions. For uh, we can, you can either address your question directly to one of our panelists, or we can try to um, answer them in the in the Q and A panel or Q and A um, board. So, um, with that, um, I was wondering if someone might want to answer which concentration would be the best for someone looking to pursue a career in the medical field. Um, would maybe. Um, uh, Chris, would you like to maybe address that? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so um, for a person who is pursuing, who wants to pursue a career in the, one of the health professions or uh, uh, particularly in medicine, uh, physiology has typically been the, uh, the, the concentration of choice for, for most students because it allows you to take courses that are uh, relevant to, to medical school. Uh, it allows you to take the, the relevant uh, chemistry, biochemistry, and physiology courses. Uh, so I think it's a, a, a great preparation for, for going to medical school. Um, that said, I, I don't think it's the only one uh, that of our concentrations that will allow you to get all of the prerequisite courses you need in order to apply for medical school. Um, working with an advisor, I think you can fit those prerequisites into um, pretty much almost all of the, uh, the concentrations that the department offers. And so if you have a particular passion for microbiology, that would be a great uh, uh, concentration as well. Um, same with cell molecular evolution and even marine biology. Uh, I think you can probably get the prerequisites for um, medical school in, in any of those concentrations. But once again, I, I, I would have to say that most of the students who are interested in uh, becoming physicians, uh, they take the physiology concentration. Thank you, Chris. I see that Kimberly's hand is up. Kimberly, would you like to pipe in there? 
Yeah, I want to say, first of all, congratulations on uh, coming to college. As a first-generation college-going student myself, I think it's, it's so exciting and so confusing all at the same time. I'm going to say I advise for the Bachelor of Arts in General Biology, and I have students who are aspiring veterinarians, optometrists, uh, physicians, teachers, conservation biologists. I think that if you know, if you're not sure what you want to do at all, the BA in General Biology is really great. And also if you know kind of exactly what you want to do, because I think that you can um, really put together a program that meets the prerequisites for the next thing that you plan on doing. So I just want to agree with my colleague, uh, Professor Moffat, that I think that there's a, a lot of different majors that can allow you to pursue a lot of different careers. And the number one thing that I see help student graduate uh, in a timely way and, um, and get classes that they want is to meet regularly with an advisor. Um, and I'll say when I was an undergrad, I did not do that. I found it really scary. And I was like, I don't want to meet with that faculty member. But that is what will really help you figure out a path forward that is just right for you. Sure, Terrific. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for thanks for adding that those details about the general biology major. I think I think you're absolutely right. I, I see so many students that come in and uh, everything from people who know exactly what they want to do to people who aren't sure. And it's and so it's a really great place for that. It gives them it gives students a lot of flexibility. But the, all the majors are great. <laughs> okay, um, other questions? Let's see. Uh, looks like a lot of the questions are being answered. Um, we are, let's see, we are coming up on, um, we, have a, we have a few more minutes. So let's see if we, if we, if anybody sees questions here that you'd like to take. Please do, or if anybody would like to speak up, please do. Well, here's one, and that maybe even the students can speak to this. Um, is physiology a competitive concentration? Um, in what sense uh, competitive? I, I think what we try to do is we try to foster um, a sense of community amongst the students so that um, students will kind of collaborate with one another to kind of support one another in, in studying and so on. And uh, I think one of the great things for getting involved in research uh, is that it enables you to uh, kind of find a, a cohort of students um, who are um, studying in, in your major. So for instance, um, I have a number of uh, students in, in my lab um, who, some of whom aspire to become uh, physicians, others who really want to go to, to graduate school. And I've found that over the years that uh, these students really form pretty tight bonds and uh, they help one another a lot with uh, not only helping to choose classes and things like that, but just kind of emotional support at times. And also they uh, form uh, study groups that way as well. Would any of our student panelists like to chime in on that? You don't have to. Um. I'll just chime in and say that, you know, I think at some schools, the pre-health majors have this reputation of being really competitive with each other. The, the pre-meds think, oh, if I'm gonna get my 4.0, that means you can't and that sort of thing. And I just don't think that really exists in our department. It's not like that. We're far more collaborative and we're not in that it's me or you kind of thing. And so I just don't see that at all. So I'd like to offer up a question to folks. How about, are there any off-campus internships for students? Does anybody want to bite chew on that one? I can if nobody else does. I would say that um, if nobody else is going to bite, so we don't have a lot of internships as in kind of formalized arrangements for undergraduates. We have quite a few for um, master's level students, but we do have quite a number of students who work off campus in a variety of ways. And we have, we have connections, let's just say, to connect you with biotech, to connect you with jobs at UCSF, to connect you with um, jobs in ecology and evolution. So um, we have connections and we can help you get there, but we don't have official internships. I'm gonna let Gretchen add on to that. We do have a center on campus that fosters internships. And for example, we have a, a formal relationship with the National Park Service where students who are interested in ecology, evolution and conservation biology uh, can have paid internships with, our, with the National Park Service. And there are a number of, of programs like that um, run out of our Institute for Civic Engagement. 
Thank you. That's perfect. I also wanted to add, uh, this is Vance Friedenberg speaking again. I also wanted to add that um, a lot of internships are, I mean, are, you, can, you can have sort of like an internship, which is working in a research lab. Sometimes they're paid positions, sometimes they're, they're um, volunteer positions. And many of us do research in the field for, so I'm an ecologist. I work on amphibians and salamanders and, and frogs. Um, and I've had students that I've taken with me to the Sierra Nevada mountains here in California. Um, I've taken students to uh, do research on frogs in the Philippines. I've taken undergraduates to the Philippines, undergraduates to, um, to Peru um, to, do, to do research there as well. So there are actually quite a few um, uh, opportunities that may not be official, like the National Park Service one that, that Gretchen mentioned that are, I mean, they're official in the sense that you work with faculty doing research, but they're not, they may not be um, seen as an internship necessarily, if that makes sense. So there are a lot of opportunities and, and that would come back to in order to find those opportunities, um, students can look at the uh, faculty web pages on the Department of Biology. Um, they can go look at their web pages, see what they're doing, and then they can go talk to them and find out what kind of research they're doing. Okay, thank you. I see that Nicole has Yes, hi, my name is uh, Nicole Coleman and I am the program administrator for the SF Build program. And the SF Build program, like other, um, there's some other programs that are uh, offered through the Student Enrichment um, Department, Student Enrichment Services, um, that offers um, fellowships or scholarships to scholars in their sophomore year. So this is like right after you've gotten the rudiments of your biology and chemistry, you can apply for uh, the Mark Rise or the Genentech Fellowship, um, uh, SF Build. There's, there's a host of others, and um, they offer you to, you know, reach out to, um, you know, research advisors and individuals doing research in biology, chemistry, and uh, you will get paid um, for doing that type of research. And then we have, like, um, through those programs, other support uh, services for professional development as well. So it's 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 like um, you're also you not only get research, but you're also getting uh, professional development, how to like make your statement of purpose and resume and CV and those things for for later use after graduation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Vance, how are we doing on time, Karen? Um, I think it's probably time that we move on to panel two. And while we do that, I just want to let students or all of you know that we'll continue to answer questions in the Q&A panel. Um, but now right. we're going to move on. And Laura, you're going to introduce the panel two slide. Is that correct? That's correct. So in our second panel, some of these questions are the ones that are already coming up in the Q&A. We have um, a variety of people to tell you about some of the many opportunities beyond the classroom. So Maria, one of our student speakers really emphasized there's so many opportunities, you just have to ask. And so we're gonna try to tell you about some of them today and then um, hopefully you'll get excited about some of these. And so again, I think we'll just go in the order that they're shown here. And Mackenzie, are you here to speak a little bit about the Student Enrichment Office? Hi, yes, I'm here. Um... Hello everybody, my name is Mackenzie Carr and I am the Administrative Support Coordinator for the Genentech Grant in the SEO Office, the Student Enrichment Opportunities Office. And our goal in the SEO Office really is to prepare students from underrepresented groups, which includes low-income students, first-generation students, um, those with disabilities, to complete BS degrees in the STEM field and um, also advanced degrees um, going forward. And we provide financial support, um, academic support and stimulating research experiences. Um, we offer community and peer building for students. Um, we really want you to you know, interact with other STEM students and we have workshops that we do. Um, we also offer funding, which includes travel for conferences, uh, monthly stipends and tuition. Including that, we have a lot of different grants and scholarships that vary from class level, um, undergrad and masters. Uh, we have partnerships with UCSF and industry sponsors too. And to qualify for the SEO office and our grants and scholarships, we, um, you can be a US citizen, DACA recipient, permanent resident. And um, we really look for individuals who again have faced uh, social 
economic educational barriers to get a career or education in STEM, um, those with disabilities. And we really want people who have a motivation to study STEM, learn and contribute. And some of the activities that we offer or support are you know, travel to summer workshops, research of course, um, professional development, peer and faculty mentoring and supplies. So um, if you have, want to know a little bit more about the SEO office, we have a website, um, seo.sfsu.edu. I'll put it in the chat. We also have our main email that um, not only I answer, but um, all of the faculty in the office, staff in the office answer. That's seo at sfsu.edu. And every Tuesday from 1 to 3 p.m., we have office hours and a different staff member hosts it every um, Tuesday. Oh, thank you, Laura, for putting that in the chat. Um, so stop by and have if you have any questions, you can ask us. We lost you there, Mackenzie. Okay, so we'll move on to, um, oh, you've locked, locked up, you're back. Oh, Are yes, you done? I'm done. <laughs> okay, terrific. Thanks so much, Mackenzie. So from there, we'll move on to Sarah Alaldi. You're here. Might be Nicole. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think you. Uh, we we were we tried to uh, coordinate earlier. We just got some links that were not working, so I'm I'm here to represent SF Field. Okay, terrific. So Nicole will represent SF Field. Hi everyone. My name is Nicole Coleman. Um, like I said earlier, when we were talking about the um, the grant or the research opportunities for the biology department. Um, I represent SF Field and um, I'm the program administrator. Um, and what we supply our, or, you know, what we deliver to our, our scholars is pretty much um, what McKinsey um, said about SEO. We are pretty much a parallel uh, program in which we um, have partnership with UCSF and uh, San Francisco State. Uh, what makes our program unique is that we have a social justice component and community research component tied to uh, our research. And so if you're interested in working with the community um, and using your biology curriculum prowess uh, in, in that field, um, you can work with uh, researchers at UCSF as well as researchers at San Francisco State um, you know, to work with the community. Also, uh, what we provide on a weekly basis is professional development. So we combine our program with um, the SEO scholars. Um, once a week, we have uh, professional development um, seminars that, um, that are hosted throughout the, the year. And it's really nice because, you know, we provide music and food at the end of the day. Um, and uh, it's a, a place to network with your colleagues and your classmates because what we try to foster is community. And um, so that's one, one benefit to uh, combining the two programs is building a, a community. Um, the other aspect of our program is um, not only do we have uh, these community engagements, but we really work with our scholars and we have like off-campus retreats where we really uh, slow down and we bring in a mindfulness uh, aspect to our community building so that if, if you get really stressed out in STEM, um, we have like this mindfulness um, curriculum that we're bringing on, that, that we have brought on to help you cope with some of the stressors. The feedback that I've gotten from scholars is that um, the biology department and the chemistry department for just cozy in general is very accommodating and um, everyone loves their professors and they don't feel um, uh, stressed out with the uh, curriculum. However, it's living in San Francisco and the stresses of transportation that tends to be more of the issue. So our MBRS, uh, our mindfulness program really helps you know, alleviate that stress. Um, uh, in addition to, to that, we pay our scholars um, a monthly stipend, and um, that monthly stipend is given to you for your research. It's really, uh, and we provide um, units for uh, research units um, for, for you to complete. And 
that's pretty much what I have to say about SF Build. If you're interested in SF Build, please visit us at sfbuild.sfsu.edu. And you can also um, email us. Uh, that's the website. You can email us at sfbuild at sfsu.edu. Thank you. Terrific. Nicole, could you put those links in the chat so that people can pull those out? Yes, I will. Thank you. Awesome. OK. So the next um, panel representatives I have are for student clubs, such as DSTEM, Black Excellence in STEM, WISE, Women in Science and Engineering, and Sacramento Society for the Advancement of Chicano and Native American Sciences. And Leila Bujess and Erica Sanchez will be representing that group, the student clubs. Hello, uh, I'm Layla. Um, I'm the president of BSTEM. And like Laura says, BSTEM stands for uh, Black Excellence in STEM. And we are um, an inclusive student organization here at SF State uh, that is focused on um, supporting people of color and their allies in STEM. And so pretty much we just provide like a safe and engaging environment for any student. Uh, we try to support um, students in research and future career planning. Uh, we collaborate with uh, other students, faculty, um, and industry to expose uh, our members to opportunities and career paths within STEM. And we also collaborate with other student organizations such as SACMIS and WISE um, by doing different for a variety of different um, outreach events such as uh, fellowship um, or funding application workshops. We've done uh, grad, grad uh, school application uh, workshops, how to find a, a research lab here in the biology department. Uh, we've done game nights and much more. Um, and I think I'll let Erica talk about SACNIS. Layla, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Erica Sanchez. I'm an assistant professor in biology and I'm, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about SACNIS um, to reiterate what Layla mentioned. Uh, I'm really proud of these student groups. Um, I participate as a faculty advisor and a supporter of a lot of these events, um, but I'm amazed at how much collaboration there is between these three groups um, and even other groups on campus. So um, WISE or Women in Science and Engineering and SACNAS, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, um, as was mentioned, have um, everything from social events like game nights. I think there's one coming up soon. Um, uh, when we are back on campus, there's a lot of food events that are kind of around different types of food and just um, getting together and supporting each other. But we also have professional development um, uh, events that are put on by these groups. These are all student run. Um, us faculty are there to support um, and participate, but they are definitely driven by the students. So again, workshops on how to get into a lab, how to get started, and um, how to go to your first research conference. There's an annual conference every year. It's a national research conference um, focused on undergraduate research that is led by SACNIS. And we send students every year. Uh, so whether they're supported by the SEO office, as Mackenzie mentioned, um, SF Build, as was discussed earlier as well, um, you have these opportunities and can learn about how to participate in these great parts of research and to um, learn how to communicate your research um, by getting involved in these student groups. So if you have any questions, please put them in the um, question and answer area and we'll try to um, answer them to our best ability. But um, a great way to not only build community, but also learn more about how to become a scientist and actively do research in our department. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you, Erica. And so next I wanna to turn to Kimberly Tanner, who's gonna tell us a little bit about opportunities to be peer leaders in the department. Hi, yeah, so I'm Kimberly Tanner. I'm professor of biology. I'm a neuroscientist by training and I study how people learn biology and how scientists choose to teach biology. Um, and when you come to San Francisco State, you're gonna learn tons of biology. You're gonna learn a lot about how scientists make discoveries in biology. But one of the things you're gonna need, no matter what career you go on to do, are leadership skills. And so we've worked really hard in the last few years to make opportunities for you to be able to do that. At the same time, you're taking a class that would count towards your major. So uh, on the slide there, it says PALS. We have a course called Peer Assistance for Learning Science. 
uh, my colleague Erica Sanchez and I have taught that course uh, together. You are, uh, it's a chance for you to partner with faculty members to really help them think about how to make classrooms as inclusive as they can be and sort of center student voices. Um, and so it's a great way to get to know a faculty member really well. Those are the ways that you have people you can write you letters of recommendation when you're going on to the next thing after you graduate. We also have a service learning sort of upper division biology course, upper division elective counts towards all of the majors. Uh, PALS is one, but leads learners engaged in advocating for diversity in science. That really helps us uh, make sure that we're, we're telling the stories of scientists from lots of different backgrounds as part of our coursework and that once again you would get to partner with faculty uh, helped make those kinds of innovations and be a leader. Um, I'll defer back to Laura to talk about peer to peer, but I just want to encourage you that I think in addition to, you know, studying for your classes, the key things to figure out in college are all those other skills you need about how to um, be a leader, how to make a group of people be able to work together well, how to make an environment where everybody you're working with feels like you belong. And our students who are involved in these courses and opportunities like PALS and LEADS, uh, they talk about those experiences in their med school interviews and their dental school interviews when they're going to grad school. So it will really set you apart compared to other students from other universities. Um, so Laura, I'll turn it back to you to maybe talk about peer to peer, which is a more recent opportunity. Thank you. I think I'm going to actually turn it to Brianna, who's been heading up that effort. Yeah, sure. I can go over it pretty uh, quickly here. Um, so peer to peer, um, I guess for you guys, it would be a great opportunity since you're um, possibly incoming freshmen or incoming transfer students to actually have a biology peer mentor. Um, so peer to peer um, can hook you up with um, a junior or a senior um, in biology. Uh, and it's actually all done um, either through your phone, so like text um, or email. Um, so it's all done virtually. Um, so it's a great way to connect um, with your peers in biology. Um, and if you do choose to come to SS State, um, you will be getting um, an email invitation to join peer to peer if you're interested in having a peer mentor. So definitely look out for that. That will be coming out in the summer. Um, so you can get. Uh, started talking to someone um, even before the fall semester starts um, so they can help you out um, with anything biology related or um, just having someone to talk to can be nice as well. So yeah, that's peer to peer. Terrific. Thank you, Brianna. Okay, so next, um, Gretchen's up on opportunities to get involved in research, which our students have already talked about a bit, but she'll elaborate on that a little bit. In the biology department at San Francisco State, we have um, a course that's called 699, which is um, an opportunity to get involved in the research lab of your choice. And so students who sign up for 699 were in uh, Gretchen, you're breaking up a little bit. And um, do a, an independent project that, that fits within the, the research. Sorry, and gets, is that? Um, so Gretchen, if you can turn off your video, your audio might be better. Um, okay, how's that? Better. Okay. So students who participate in 699 um, really find a home in a laboratory. And one of the great things about participating in 699 is not just that you get to do um, science that is working towards a publication, working towards a real contribution, but it really um, introduces you to a peer group that are the people um, who are interested in the things you're interested in. And it gives you those experiences that you can write about on your graduate applications, your medical school applications, and it gives you that hands-on uh, hands place to apply the knowledge that you've gotten in your classes. So 699s are, are one of the neatest things about coming to the biology department at San Francisco State, and virtually every laboratory um, in the department um, hosts students in those positions. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Gretchen. Okay, so um, I'm looking in the Q&A to see if there's other questions for these panelists. And one person asked a question that I can actually answer. Will we be able to learn more about the climate change certificate? And so the answer to that is yes. Um, like I said, it's not on a website yet because it's just uh, late breaking news. 
but I was one of the people that um, developed the certificate. And so it's a certificate in, I said, the causes, impacts, and solutions for climate change. There'll be four courses in the certificate. And those courses are gonna have a big overlay with the general education courses that you need to take for the university anyway. So it shouldn't be any extra units to take that, get, earn that certificate. And we're trying to engage as many students as possible in um, thinking about climate change. The courses range, you'll have to take one foundational course, one in um, causes, one in impacts, one in solutions. And the courses will be offered over the entire campus, um, at least throughout four of the academic colleges. So not just science and engineering, but also liberal and creative arts and college of ethnic studies and um, human and um, social sciences. So there's gonna be a lot going on there. And so I actually um, neglected here, the last person on our panelist list too, is um, for the Estuary and Ocean Science Center. I keep forgetting people. And that's Kathy Boyer and Karina Nielsen. So um, Kathy was gonna share her screen, I think. Yes, but you have to stop sharing your screen, Laura, for a second. Ah, indeed I do. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I should be sharing now. Okay, so I'm actually tag teaming this uh, together with Karina Nielsen and I'm gonna let her start. Great, thanks, Kathy. Um, I'm the um, out at the, at the Estuary and Ocean Science Center, and we've got a little picture of what it would look like out here. We're, we're the off-campus center that focuses on marine and estuarine sciences, and we're just over the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, you can see the little map there showing you where we are. And we're one of the organized research units on campus um, that connects, and our mission is kind of to connect science, society, and the sea for a healthy planet. And we have a couple of partner organizations that we work with and that are based here on site um, that are opportunities also for internships. Kathy will talk a little bit more about that. Um, the San Francisco Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is a NOAA pro uh, program from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and then the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is also based here, another national level program that uh, sponsors students and internships often in the summer. I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy so she can tell you a little bit about the um, opportunities to get involved with research and um, um, other fun stuff here. Um, and Kathy, go ahead, take it away. Yeah, sure. So um, we teach courses, um, field courses out at the EO Center. And those include ones that are, are part of this new climate change certificate. So we're really excited about that. Uh, a lot of our work is associated with um, human impacts and climate change to estuarine and marine environments. So lots of opportunities for, for hands-on um, experience. And um, we, that includes independent study. So, so you could do a 699, the independent study course um, and work in someone's research lab and, and gain experience that way and work with our graduate students. Um, we have a semester long marine immersion program for undergraduates called DEEP, which you I think heard about earlier. I wasn't tuned in then, but that's the diving into ec um, ecology and evolution program. And um, I co-teach that with Karen Crow, and some of that work, um, some of that uh, marine immersion activity is, is based out at the EO Center and on our boats. You can see pictures of students participating in some of that. Um, we also have an REU program, was, which is um, in part based at the EO Center. This is a research for um, undergraduates uh, experience program. And that's a summer program where you can come and get lots of hands-on experience. And then internships, as Karina mentioned, uh, with our faculty that are either in departments, um, including biology, but also other departments within the university. Um, and with our partners, the San Francisco Bay NUR and the Smithsonian, um, lots of opportunities for internships. So um, these can be great um, options and, and ways to get good experience for graduate school and to get prepared for the workforce. So uh, we really hope you will get in touch. So if you want to get um, more information, learn more about what we do at the EO Center, um, there's a web page link for you and you can find faculty profiles and contact information for all of us if you want to get in touch and, or learn more about our programs. So that's all I have. Terrific. Thank you so much. So um, let's see, there's a question in Q&A for bio 699, will the students be assigned to one lab during the class? And um, no, so how it works, how you get signed up for 699 
is you go to the website and you look up professors research interests and you kind of decide on maybe a few things that you might be interested in you email the professor and kind of say hey i'm interested in your research um, is there any chance you have space in your lab can we talk about it and you make an appointment to go see them during office hours and then you talk to a few people and um see if it works out for you to join them lab. If they don't have room right away, just keep asking um, because room opens up and uh, you get your foot in the door, you know, hey, can I come to your lab meetings? Can I do this? Can I do that? And so there's, there's lots of ways to kind of wiggle your way in. And we, by the time people graduate, I, I would say that we accommodate most of the people who want research experiences. Over a quarter of our students get engaged in the research lab, but like um, Kimberly said, there's plenty of opportunities for people who don't want to do research as well. Okay, very good. Are there any other questions from any of our participants? There's a lot of opportunities here. So please know that we will share these slides with you and you'll get all the links and everything with them. The recording will also be shared. So you'll have access to this. All right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, um, next steps then. So what happens now? And so actually, there were some questions about what's going to happen in fall of 2021. As you know, we've been largely closed down for the pandemic. Some of our research has been open, but we have not been teaching courses on campus. And so. Um, what do we know about fall? We know that COVID-19 is still here. We know that many, many people are getting vaccinated, which is fantastic. I encourage you to do that as soon as you're eligible to do so. Um, the university has to comply with the regulations set forth by San Francisco um, Public Health Department. And so that's where we look to for our guidance. Right now, we have been instructed to plan for limited face-to-face -face courses, but the governor just, um, announced that old universities should plan to be fully face to face in the fall. So we are waiting like you for information from on high to find out what we're supposed to do because we have two different messages right now. We expect to know more in a couple of weeks and we'll certainly communicate that with you. And this will be true for, you know, CSUs and UCs across the state. It's not just unique to San Francisco State. We're all trying to figure out what the current regulations are and how to get people back to school, but keep everybody safe. When we come back, we anticipate that we'll be mostly face-to-face -face and you know, we'll continue to offer some online and hybrid courses for people that want a different variety of things to take. Okay, so let me find my cursor here. Whoops, I mean to be sharing my screen, hang on. There we go, and then what do you do now? You've heard this, our little webinar here. You're like, oh, I'm so stoked. I can't wait to be a Gator. What do you do? So you would log into your San Francisco State um, Student Center on or before May 1st and click on the link that I showed here and click on the accept button. And then you will be a Gator. And so I'll pop that into chat real quick if I can. And uh, let's see here. Get it to panel stand attendees. So that's where you're going to want to be. And then what happens after that? So the next thing that will happen is you'll be invited to attend summer orientation. And we have two different summer orientations. Um, one is for freshman students and one is for transfer students because they have slightly different courses that they're going to be taking at the beginning. And the orientation is there to really get you set up. What is, how do you get your email? How do you get on the iLearn, which is our kind of classroom um, Blackboard system? How do you add classes? How do you register for classes? And so orientations to help you navigate all of these steps. What classes should I take? It'll include time to meet with advisors who will help you map out your degree plan and even decide exactly which degree to pursue. The orientations are one day long, so you don't have to sacrifice a huge amount of time. They run from nine to five and are just highly recommended. For first time freshmen, the dates are from June through July. For transfer students, they're from July through August. So as soon as you accept, your very next step should be to sign up for summer orientation because it's just going to be super helpful and you'll be glad you did. How do you sign up for orientation? Once you've admitted, here's the link to go to. and um, I'll get that into chat again. 
and like I said, you'll get all these uh, slides as well, but you'll have it here. And then sign up begins for and on April 19th for first time freshmen and begins on May 3rd for transfer students. So the sooner you accept your offer, it's going to be really easy to sign up for your um, orientation session. The earlier you sign up, the more choice of dates you'll have. The later you sign up, the fewer choices of your dates you'll have. If for some reason you can't make it to the orientation, and it will be a virtual orientation, so you don't have to travel to San Francisco for the orientation, it will be virtual. If you can't make it to the orientation because of work or something else, then you can start registering on August 2nd. But what you'll see is that by attending orientation, you get to register earlier, and this will get you into more of the classes that you want to be in. So. What do I do if the class I want to take is full and I can't register? So don't panic, don't despair, it's okay, we'll figure it out. First step is to send an email to the instructor of the course you would like to enroll in. Just let them know, hey, I'm hoping to take this course, it seems to be full, are you gonna be letting in any more students? Second step is to email the biology department, um, if it's a biology course, so email biology at sfsu.edu. Let us know if the that you've been locked out of a class. And we'll keep a track of the number of students that are locked out of taking class. And we'll add more sections when we need to. We don't want anybody to be locked out of a class because it's full. So we're here to help. And then the third thing, which is perhaps the most important thing, is be an advisor. We have multiple kinds of advisors on, on campus that will help you navigate these situations. So there's a College Student Success Center to help you navigate your university requirements and your general education requirements. And then there's biology advisors who will help you navigate your biology requirements. And we really urge you to see an advisor um, as soon as possible. Having said that, how and when do I find a biology advisor? Right away. Um, we're here to help. The, we've shown in our studies that the sooner you see an advisor, it can chop an entire year off of your college career by seeing an advisor early. Um, you won't make the mistakes that people who don't see advisors um, often make. And so see an advisor as soon as you arrive on campus. If we're virtual, then you'll see them by a Zoom appointment. If we're in person, you can come visit them in person. We will also hold biology advising workshops for new students on Friday, August 20th. So make sure and mark your calendar on that day that you're going to come to the biology workshops and we'll um, send emails up about those as well. So peer-to-peer -peer mentors, we mentioned them in the context of, you know, someday you might be a mentor, but for now you can be a mentee. Um, and so new students coming in will have the opportunity to be paired with um, students who are further along in their biology degrees. And you'll connect by text messages and just be able to ask them any questions. Oh, hey, when I come to campus, where do I put my stuff? And they'll say, oh, there's some lockers in the building. You can rent a locker. Um, you know, what do I need to bring? Do I need to bring my laptop to class? Do I need to do this? How do I find an advisor? What classes should, you know, anything you want, you can ask your peer mentor. And it'll all happen by text unless you guys set up a different way to um, meet or interact. So we really encourage you to sign up for that. Um, we expect that the vast majority of you will get peer mentors. Um, there's some additional information, which I'm not gonna go over, but you can um, access it when you look in the slides, but particularly about financial aid and housing, which are important considerations for new students. The last thing I wanna share from you is just some advice from some of our San Francisco State alumni about how to be successful. And, this is really important. So they tell us, and these are their words, not ours, interact with everyone around you. Don't be shy. Trust me, you will need a study buddy. And what we know is you're gonna learn a ton from faculty and staff here at San Francisco State. We have so much to offer. You're gonna learn even more from your peers. It's an amazing group of peers and you'll just be blown away. And these are the peers that you're, will be your colleagues for life. And so, um, take advantage of them and just interact and study and just connect. Next, be active in class discussions. Yep, even if it's on Zoom, um, do all your homework and written assignments and you should be able to learn a lot and be successful. Attend lectures and participate in iClicker questions, which is a way of kind of doing polls in person, as well as discussions, make a study group, 
get to know your advisors and instructors. Many of you are someday are going to want letters of recommendation. If we don't know you, it's super hard to write that letter. So come to our office hours, come get to know us. You'll find out that we're really approachable people. We kind of seem scary at first, um, but come get to know us. We, we're here to help and um, cultivate those relationships so that you have those letters of recommendation when you need them when you graduate. Ask for help. It's one of the hardest things in life to do. I'm 56, I'm still learning how to ask for help, but ask for help, we are here to help you. And then seek out opportunities to get involved in research and community service and other types of things that we have going on. There's so many things that, that ways that students can participate, whether it's outreach to K through 12 schools, outreach to community colleges, um, getting folks interested in science, um, research. There's, there's just so many ways to be involved. So, and then, as I mentioned earlier, join us for class. We've got five or six classes that you can come and visit. If you fill out this Qualtrics survey, it'll say which classes they are and what time they're offered. And you can click on the ones you wanna come visit. And then we'll send you a Zoom link so that you can drop in on class. The instructors will be expecting you. It won't be a surprise like, oh, hey, what are you doing here? And um, it'll, be, it'll be really fun to have you visit with our current students. Okay, so um, this kind of brings the end of our regular session, uh, is the end of our regular session. And so for those of you who aren't, don't want to stay for the pre-health session, our bonus session, you're welcome to sign off now. We appreciate you being here. And for those of you who want to stay on for pre-health session, that's still coming. But to everybody, we're so glad that you joined us today. Um, we think we have a really wonderful department and would love to see you join us. So um, I think I can speak for all of us on that. All right, so we'll say adieu to those who are signing off and not interested in pre-health careers. And then for those who are, we will keep going for a little bonus session. Okay. So I'm gonna check and see how many participants we have now. I assume it's gonna drop off a little bit. Let's just so next, remember also, um, sorry. But that, Laura, yeah, go ahead. To remind everyone, it's also the pre-veterinary professions as well. Yeah, pre so pre-health and pre-vet pre opportunities. Yeah. Thank you. And so I'd like to introduce um, our next panelist for pre-health. We've got Armon, Armand Karakosian, Rachel Small, and Brianna Franklin. Um, Armand, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of say what your role is with the pre-health majors? You're muted, I think. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I teach anatomy, uh, biology course 328, uh, lecture in the lab section of it, and as well as the uh, new class that we opened up recently this spring semester, is, which is called uh, Introduction to Pre-Health um, pre uh, Fields. Um, which where we invite multiple specialties uh, in the class, uh, being from OBGYN, pediatricians, uh, surgical areas, and guest speakers that do the speaking uh, from their fields. Uh, I myself am a, a foot and ankle surgeon, and I've been at San Francisco State since 20, 2006. That's fantastic, thank you. Rachel, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Hi, so I'm Rachel Small. I am the uh, director of the pre-health postdoc programs at San Francisco State. Um, I've been here since 2012 and I do a lot of advising in the pre-health professions. Uh, so I'm very familiar with the process of applying to uh, different schools and kind of some of the requirements, class requirements, et cetera. Um, I'm also a lecturer in the chemistry department and I teach uh, general chemistry um, and survey of chemistry. Thanks so much, Rachel. And Brianna, you can introduce yourself and what your role is with pre-health advising. Hi, everyone. So as I mentioned earlier, I am the undergraduate specialist. Um, I am not a health professional, but I have been helping the biology department um, put on a lot of our pre-health and pre-med um, webinars and just information sessions. Um, so if you have general questions about pre-health, you can always email me at the biology website. Um, biology at sfsu.edu. Um, I will help answer your questions and um, direct you to 
the right people. Um, so I will be here just in case there are any questions. Yeah, thank you, Brianna. And I'll riff off of that a little bit. Biology has been trying um, trying to up our game in pre-health advising. And so we've been offering a variety of webinars. Um, so in addition to our freshman and first time uh, and transfer student orientations in the fall, we'll offer a pre-health orientation. We also have a lot of recordings online um, from our past webinars, but we've had some terrific panelists. So some alumni that have gone on to uh, medical school or PA school or nursing school, plus um, various people from UCSF um, and beyond. So we really have uh, some deep knowledge that we can bring in to help us help you navigate your way to a career in health profession. So, um, so pre-veterinary, Chloe, do you wanna say a little bit about that? Hi everyone, my name is Chloe. I'm the current president of the Pre-Veterinary Society here at SF State. And um, I did want to mention that it is a relatively new student organization. It's been up and running for the past year and um, we've grown pretty, pretty big now. Um, there's actually a surprisingly large amount of students interested in vet med here at SF State, which is really good and interesting because now we have um, this sort of community for animal lovers and people interested in going the veterinary route or a veterinary technician route. Um, if you're interested in joining this club, please feel free to send me a message. I'll um, also drop our club website in the chat here. And on that website, you can find pretty much anything you could possibly want to know, whether that's how to get involved with us, what classes you want to take at SF State, um, what the prerequisites for veterinary schools are. And we also have a couple other fun things like an Instagram account. We do at-home activities that are more um, hands-on for learning different technical skills. We've also spoken to a lot of guest speakers. So if you're interested in like different niches of the vet med field, like maybe lab animal medicine or zoology um, companion medicine, there's holistic medicine, the list goes on for ages. Um, but if you wanna hear from different specialists, that's um, a great place to find our recordings. And we do have meetings um, quite frequently about every other week. So if you're interested, um, yeah, feel free to give me an email or send a message. All right, thanks so much, Chloe. So um, I'm gonna ask a question that's kind of general. Armand, do you have any general advice for somebody coming to San Francisco State who's considering a pre-health career? Uh, yeah, um, I would definitely suggest that there is going to be prerequisites that each individual medical school requires, even nursing school. Um, there is a there is a different step that each each institution that is going to require for students to go through. Uh, meeting with an advisor on a um, you know on a semester basis or even every couple of months would be beneficial to see if they're on track on taking the specific classes. Um, now, looking at medical schools, there are some medical schools that have waived their MCATs uh, to, to begin with, but you know, coming up in the next maybe a year or so, I think they're gonna have them uh, to, to bring them back. But currently there's certain institutions in med schools that are waiving them, but um, it's, it's a, you know, I, I think SF State has a great environment in, in participating in different projects, you know, like everybody were saying, research groups, um, as well as you know, our anatomy department is, is great as well too, because we, I think we're one of the institutions that do dissections, as well as trying to teach some surgical skills uh, during the classes as well too. Um, but I think the main major thing is keeping with the advisors, you know, keeping in touch with them and asking as many questions as you can getting letters of recommendation and to go through the process would definitely help out. Thank you. Rachel, do you have anything to add to, you know, what our incoming transfer and freshman students should be thinking about as they're preparing for careers in either pre-health or um, pre-veterinary studies? I'll let Chloe sure. add on to the end. Yeah, thank you. You know, I, when I was listening to um, what Armand was saying, I was agreeing with so much of that, uh, that's something that I always really recommend. Uh, actually, when I when I first came in, Laura, uh, you were talking about how pre-health can kind of be seen as competitive in some other areas, but it's not like that at SF State. And I wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, 
this place, um, you know, San Francisco State is very collaborative, very cooperative, very community focused. And so I can't stress that enough that one of the best pieces of advice is, um, you know, as a pre-health student, focus on that and know that you have a community, reach out and use the resources that are available to you. You know, find those classmates, form study groups, um, keep one another motivated, uh, talk to your professors, talk to, find your advisor early, check in with them, they are here to help you navigate this whole experience and they want to help you do that. So that's something I would really highly recommend as well. Thanks. Right. Chloe, do you have any advice for pre-vet students who arrive on campus? Yeah, if you're interested in um, pre-vet studies or if you're not sure um, what pathway you want to go or if you need more information about different veterinary schools, um, definitely send the pre-vet club a message or feel free to join. We have a lot of resources. There's, um, oh my goodness, so many. I can't even like name them off the top of my head. There's cost maps for vet schools. There's financial aid, um, scholarship opportunities. If you're looking to start your career in vet med, maybe you want to um, try your hand at working in a clinic, um, feel free to give us a message. We do have uh, quite extensive contacts and um, hospitals are always hiring. They're always in need of help. If you're looking for internship opportunities, we do have those as well. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, everything you could possibly need is on our website. You just gotta look for it. Terrific, thank you. And I guess one thing I wanna emphasize, um, one of our panelists from a previous uh, webinar, Tomas Magana, who's a physician at um, Children's Health in Oakland, he emphasized that there is no right major for um, pre-health careers, that the big thing is to make sure that you look at the schools you're interested in applying to and look at the prerequisites. There's some common things and there's some slightly different things, but to really look at those, look at the prerequisites and then take the major you love. Just get involved in what you love and excel at it. And that that's the thing to do. So any biology would major would work. You might be like, oh, I really love ecology, but I want to be a pre-med. That's fine. I really love English, but I want to be a pre-med. That's fine too. I know most of you are here for biology, but you can really major in anything um, to be a pre-med or a pre-PT or pre-PA, pre-nursing, um, those sorts of things. You just have to pay attention to the prerequisites and we offer a lot of resources to help you identify what those are. And in fact, we're building a new website that will help um, our pre-health majors kind of navigate some of those different um, things as well. So let's see what kind of questions we have. We have a question about SEO. Do we still have panelists from SEO? Is an SEO an application you have to complete every year? I think it is um, that you would have to, you know, try again each year. And so that's for the student enrichment office. Um, and if any students have questions and just want to raise their hand, we can do that too. We have few enough people now that we can uh, just have people raise their hands and um, do that. So let's see if I can find, yeah, because we can make it so you can talk. Are there any further questions? So we're here to help. We've got, uh, you know, all of our advisors can help you map out a pathway that will help you satisfy your prerequisites. As Armand said, some schools require the MCAT, some don't. Um, there's lots of different considerations there. But as we said earlier, for anybody, get to know your instructors. You're going to want to cultivate those letters of recommendation. You need those letters of recommendation to be successful in your application. So even if you don't have a science -y question for them, just go talk to them, find out more about them and about their pathway. It doesn't have to be a fancy thing. So here's a question for Chloe. Does the Pre-Vet Society have relations with vet schools such as UC Davis? So we don't have any official relationships, but we have spoken to um, different faculty members and veterinarians currently on site at UC Davis. If you have um, specific questions or maybe free time, um, you can definitely go check out our recorded meetings with them. Um, our most recent one was with Dr. Stilo, who's a behavior clinician at the teaching hospital at UC Davis, which is really interesting. And she shared a lot of good insight and advice on the application process and um, little things to look out for when you're applying to vet school. Um, and if you'd like, we can always um, set up another meeting, whether that be with the whole organization or just like a one-on-one -on -one 
question and answer type of thing if you're interested in that. Okay. So here's another good question. If you choose zo zoology as a major, and so to be clear, we don't have zoology anymore. It's been merged into a major with a new name called ecology, evolution, and conservation biology, but it's still there. Can you still become a vet? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so um, similar to the human medicine track, um, any major can qualify you for veterinary school as long as you do specific required courses. And those classes that are required by vet schools, they do vary amongst the different vet schools, but the majority of them are the same. And um, we actually do have a resource for this on our website. We've started a spreadsheet where we're compiling all of the classes offered at SF State, and we're comparing them to the course listings at different veterinary schools. And so it's, it makes it a bit easier in determining which classes you actually need to take and which ones will count towards vet school. So somebody, possibly the same person followed up with, well, what would be the best major, the most popular major? So there is no best major. Is there a most popular major for students that attend um, vet school? I would say um, the biology major with a concentration in zoology does have a lot of courses that correspond with the vet school prerequisites. So if you're going to take these classes anyway for vet school, you might as well get a major for it. Um, another thing to consider is the chemistry minor. A lot of the vet school prerequisites require extensive chemistry courses, and they actually do count for a chemistry minor here at SF State. So you might as well do that if you're um, right. if you're thinking of just a reminder that the old biology, the zoology concentration will now be called ecology, evolution, and um, conservation biology, but it's all still in there. All those courses that you'll need as prereqs. There's another question that's kind of more general, but what, what's the difference between being at a UC than SF State? Is SF State easier and more flexible or what's, what's the big difference? Anybody want to chew on that? You can get multiple answers on that because I bet there are multiple answers. Um, I, I can give one perspective. I... I think one of the big differences you'll find is that the UC system has a, has a greater emphasis on research, uh, whereas the uh, San Francisco State, for instance, uh, we emphasize both um, teaching and, res uh, and research. And uh, I can say from personal experience that students who have transferred from uh, um, Berkeley to uh, San Francisco State um, have told me that they've uh, found that the, the instructors are, are more accessible and that the, the that they're they've enjoyed their classes here more than they they did at, at UC Berkeley. But I think to a certain extent, it's, it's probably something that's a very personal choice. Um, but I, I think the one big difference, again, is that just the, the emphasis on teaching as a and um, excellence in teaching is, I think, more highly emphasized at, uh, at a school like San Francisco State. Yeah. Anybody else want to pipe in with on riff off of that? I would, I would say, very, I would echo very much the same comments that I've heard from students that have transferred out of the UC system to San Francisco State, is that um, we place a higher emphasis on quality teaching and that we have um, more accessible faculty, that more personable and more accessible faculty. So if you want to get to know your faculty, then um, the San Francisco State would be a great place to come. And so there's a question about what's a popular major in regards to biology that can help me prepare to join the physical therapy program? Armand, do you, or Rachel, do you want to Take that one on. Uh, so any, yeah, and if, same things that have been said about physical therapy or um, about the other health professions. There's no one major, but most likely the um, physiology concentration, since they would be having most of the prerequisites align with that concentration. There's also just to keep in mind a few um, courses from the kinesiology department that students would um, need to take for that as well. And there was a question that I see Chris answered online, but that are professors still accessible in these huge monster introductory biology courses? 
And I want to take that on as somebody who's taught introductory biology 230, which had 320 students in it. And it seems so intimidating and so impersonal when you walk in there. And I can tell you, we usually have two or three instructors in the course. So one person would be on the stage and another would be circulating through the audience. And that class, the students get to know each other so well because they're always talking to each other. There's such a great sense of community in that class. People get bag tags so they can recognize each other across class, across campus. And um, by and large, when we come out at the end of the semester, students say, oh my gosh, I'm so surprised. I walked in this large, large class and I thought I would just be kind of falling into a black hole. And instead I found a community and this is my cohort that I know I will go through the major with. And so we've worked really hard to make our large classes feel small and intimate, even though they're quite large. And I think you'll find your community of biologists in those classes. They're really, they're really super classes. Anybody else? I see that we're at 4.53. So people are probably a little pooped after two hours of Zooming um, on a Friday afternoon. So um, I just want to really thank everybody for coming. And um, we hope that um, you will accept our offer because we'd really love to meet you in person. And of course, if you have any more questions, just follow up with at biology at sfq.edu and you will reach Brianna who will reach out to any of us that um, seem relevant to answering your questions. But um, we're here to help and uh, we hope to see you soon. So thanks so much for coming and have a great weekend. Okay, is it just us now? Almost. Yeah. This was fantastic. So glad Good. to see all these students here. Absolutely Good. wonderful.